Hello, hello, hello. Thank you for checking out The Latrell Show, building businesses, bars, and brands. I recently had the opportunity to catch up with an old friend, Chef Dave Martin. If you can't think of the name, um, in back in 2006, he took a chance on a new reality show called Bravo's Top Chef. Since being on the show, he has established himself as a consummate professional in the catering and events businesses, as well as consulting on some monster projects in New York, US, and worldwide. What I really enjoy about Dave's business is that he is like a chameleon. Um, He can adapt to pretty much any situation. He has an extraordinary range of global cuisines, and that makes him in very high demand in casual and upscale dining. So I'm so pleased to have Chef Dave Martin uh, on my show. Thank you so much, Chef Dave Martin. So uh, so tell us about your career. How'd you get started? So, you know, this is... You know, technically my second career, I was in uh, on the tech side of things before I switched to food, which would have been in 2002. I went back to school, um, you know, culinary side of things this time and kind of pretty much a real fast track. Um, I was doing like side gigs with Spago and events uh, and then kind of rolled right into uh, an executive chef role in Manhattan Beach, California, and then landed on Top Chef and then got moved to New York and then, you know, spent the last 12, 13 years there, you know, really growing and learning and, you know, kind of building my brand, building my company and, you know, working my ass off. Yeah. I mean, I mean, building your brand is, is, First of all, it's a big deal. But I mean, you were on, you know, how, where, where did Top Chef come in and, and how did that help? Yeah, Top Chef, you know, that was actually from Craigslist. So, um, you know, I was a recruiter. And so I even when I switched to food, I was and I still look for all my own gigs. Like, that's just what I do. I'm always just seeing what I might find out there. But, um, you know, that was just a huge platform. It was season one. I mean, it was kind of before it was really cool, but, you know, there was a large audience and that kind of, you know, it just was a big help. You know, I was a very young cook at that point and, you know, just like a year and a half or so out of school. So still, you know, kind of lame on my end, but, you know, you got to start somewhere. Well, that show ended up blowing up though. And being the first, oh, yeah. be, being the freshman class of that show was a big deal. I mean, you know, I, I mean, it's still, yeah. it's still a big deal. Um, but, oh, yeah. but being, oh, yeah, it's a huge, yeah. But I mean, did you have to look for work so hard after, after that? Or, I mean, that was really good exposure. Um, yeah, the exposure was good. And I happened to be in New York and met some people that were opening a new place and, boom, they moved me to the city and that exploded right after I got there because they were ran out of funding. So I was like, okay, great. I've left any work behind. I'm in New York and what am I going to do? So I actually started hustling and just making calls and calling venues where I could get in and do gigs, corporate gigs. Um, so I started picking that up. I did some shit in the Hamptons. It was a nightmare. That story's scary, but, Mm -hmm. um, you know, this was like, and then I reached out to a friend, uh, Mark Murphy of Landmark. And I was like, dude, I'm like, you're one of the few people I know here. Like, I don't want to work in the kitchen, but can I be a server? And I actually, I worked as a server for two weeks at Landmark and met people that had a restaurant and they hired me as their chef to like get them going. <laughs> wow. So that's the, you know, yeah, so I'm kind of a hustler. Like I, you know, I'm there, I got to figure it out. You know, it was expensive and I was, yeah, it was very frightening, but that's kind of how I rebooted myself right after getting to the city and having everything kind of implode on me. That is not, it's a, a shamefully uncommon story. Like that kind of, that kind of shit happens all the time where you like have things lined up, you have the skills, you have the yeah. opportunity. And then for whatever reason, the infinite variables that you can't control, something happens and it, and nothing happens. Um, you know, yeah. like recovering from that is a very, very difficult thing. Like how does one do that? Like from a mental standpoint, it's gotta be disappointing. <sighs> Yeah, you know, it's disappointing, it's frightening, it's kind of every emotion you're experiencing, you know, especially coming to a new area. Um, Yeah, you know, I'm sure like for a couple days, I freaked and called all my friends back home and then just was like, okay, we'll get on the phone or figure something out because you got to, you know, you got to generate revenue. And, you know, I'll say that that still takes place. You know, so for anyone that's curious, like, you know, no matter what level you get to or you're at, um, you know, on the consulting side, as I'm sure, Jason, you know, like the deal can be the best deal in the world and you've got it signed and, you know, it never finishes, you know, you never go to the finish line. So, you know, those things 
still happen in my day to day life. And I think that's why it's important that I try to be diversified so that I have my restaurant consulting projects, I have my events, and then I do my other stuff with commodity boards and doing uh, consumer recipe development. So I think it's very important um, as a consultant to be diversified and not just rely on one income stream because they all go up and down. Right, Jason? Yeah, no doubt. I, I mean, uh, my story is that one year I had 60% of my re- 65% of my revenue came from a single client. Um, and, and I was yeah. living high on the hog. I mean, I was doing really well. And yeah. then they decided to take my position in house. And so I was down to 35% of my resume uh, of my revenue from one month to the next. And that was devastating. Yep. I did not understand, uh, outreach at that point. I did not understand how to hustle up business at that point. I was just like, wow, this is great. This is going to go on for the next 40 years. And then I'm going to retire. Um, right. that, obviously that's like unrealistic. I understand that now. And so now I have a podcast so I can, you know, <laughs> draw attention to myself and my friends. Right. Um, right. But, but it's like, you know, it's really important to like ki- kind of constantly be, um, if you can't, you know, if you're not a part of something that's relevant, then you need to create the relevance. Correct. And uh, you had written a book at that point, and I think that you kind of got it way, way earlier on that that you know you need to promote yourself as a brand, and you were very good at that. And it wasn't like in that smarmy way either. Like it was like it wasn't like, no, hey, I- I'm trying to sell you stuff. It was like, hey, I'm providing value. Even then, and that was before I that was well before I understood the whole concept. So I mean, you well, well, yes, and I was still learning at that point too. And here's how. Let me tell you how that stuff came about you know, same thing. I was like, how else can I generate revenue? Okay. And I was doing big corporate events or doing food and wine festivals or whatever it might be all around the country. Right. And I was like, well, you know, cause my book was self-published, you know, I didn't have a publisher, you know, like you got to be really big to do all that stuff. That's a whole different game. So I was like, well, let me just do this on my own. So I ended up doing two books on my own because what happened is say I get paid whatever five or 10 K for the gig, I could roll cookbooks onto the whole you know, everyone would, they'd buy the cookbooks to give to the client. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that was basically another way, another way to make revenue off something that was, you know, already done and published. So that's how the books came about. And then the same thing, that's, I started my rub and sauce business because that was also another add on that I could do, you know, get the big chunk of change for the dinner. And then they'd buy, you know, the client would buy a book, a rub, a sauce, and that would go home with the, you know, the guest at the event. So it would add on another 60, 80 bucks on, you know, per person that was a takeaway. So that's how kind of like I rolled in the books and the sauces and rubs to have another revenue stream. And then I also, with the sauces and rubs marketed to all the box companies and all those companies that were doing the delivery boxes and some uh, brick and mortar. So like, I, I kind of forget that I did all that shit too. So. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you, you kind of become this multidimensional brand where people can be like, Hey, wait a second. Not only is he capable of producing this dish at, at my event or at my restaurant or at my consulting opportunity, whatever, or for my, for yum brands or Pepsi as you've done in the past, I think. Um, uh, but you've also can produce these products, which kind of makes you more, um, even more marketable in my opinion, because it means that you can create something and deliver it, um, without right. a whole lot of help. Um, I think that's a huge thing. Um, the, the book thing is, uh, I I just feel like everybody should keep a journal because, um, people underestimate the value of the thoughts and ideas in their heads. And when they put that down on paper, like I'm writing a book right now. Um, and, um, when you put that down on paper, um, you can kind of see that, that possibly this could be a value for somebody else. Um, but more so, even if you never intend to sell your book, like it's a call, it's like a business card and it's a very valuable business card. You can be like, Hey, listen, I'm the author. I'm an author now. (laughs) <laughs> right. You know, when, right. when that right. happens, like you can kind of, you know, maybe tack on a couple of digits onto your, on your consulting fee. Well, exactly. It's about the, you know, again, it's the diversification. So, you know, going through that whole process of self-publishing, you know, I've helped other people do that and, you know, whatever, taking a little bit of money just to show them the ropes. And then same thing with doing the rubs and sauces, I've learned the whole co-packer chain. So I know how to work with co-packers. So if I've got a client that wants to take a product to market, I did a couple of companies after that, that one, I was doing it to help generate more revenue, right? Without like being in the streets. And two, um, now that turned into something that became a skill set for me of how to source and find co-packers for XYZ's, you know, product that they want to bring to market. So, you know, it ended up being something that I put in my toolbox in terms of, you know, things that I could do, self-publishing, co-packing, um, that were just really things to help me survive, um, 
that are now, you know, things that I can do. Yeah. And, and it's a whole nother universe out there. I mean, like you can come up with a single product in your kitchen and then say, Hey, make this for me and then pay packages for me and then ship it off to Amazon. And then they'll uh, do your things for you based on your Shopify store. And like, there's a lot yeah. of scenarios that exist that you don't even have to touch your own product. Um, and, yeah. and it's like a whole nother universe right now. And it's like a whole nother level of hustling that, that, you know, who's got it figured out is like the teenagers of America. They're like, I'm making yeah. triple digit, like six figure salaries every year on drop shipping. It's like, what do you do? Yeah. What are you talking about? You're a teenager. Um, yeah. and it's like, yeah. the, it's like, it's like that kind of hustle that, that, um, I feel like we're a little slow to learn, honestly. Right, 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 right. Well, cause you don't know, you know, and so like, you know, <laughs> I just jumped in and did it, you know, and I, I, I don't, I don't put myself on a pedestal. I like, I, that was survival. I'll do for it. Me. I'll put you on a pedestal. No, but you know what I mean? So like, I, I forget that I've done all these things, you know, cause I just, I just keep going and moving forward and going to the next step and learning more and doing better and all of those things. So I forget like, you know, having this conversation is good cause it does help me realize that, yeah, like I can figure things out and make things happen and I don't have to always rely on others. That's the real, that's a very important thing is you really have to be self-sustaining and really it has to be up to you, you know, like magically jobs don't fall on my lap. Sometimes they do, but like literally right before we started this chat, I, w I was online looking for consulting opportunities around the country. So like, that's part of my day to day. I don't have, you know, one, there's no silver spoon, but two, it doesn't just magically all come together. Sometimes it does, but I'm still in the trenches and seeking out the next possible great client or opportunity. Yeah. I mean, I was going to ask you about that. What's your uh, client acquisition strategy? Like, how do you go out so, and hustle up business? Yeah. So there's a couple things. Again, my recruiting background pays off, but um, one, I met, I got referred to a guy who's like a, on the business side who brings me in on projects for the culinary side. So I met him and through him, I've met some really great branded design agencies um, in uh, like in the South and also in New York. And so fortunately I've clicked with those teams. So when they have a need for culinary, which they don't always like, let's keep in mind, these are branded design companies that are there to set up new fast casuals or whatever. So typically there's a chef attached to that. So I've had the good fortune that there's been a couple projects lately, or there have been a couple projects where they're like, Dave, we need a chef. And they kind of thankfully reach out to me. So I've got those things that are kind of there, but in terms of new business, I literally am, I've started a list and I've already started reach outs to other companies that are like those agencies and just saying, Hey, what's up, Dave Martin? I've done these nine, 12, 15 projects, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So I'm doing actually personal reach outs to other groups. Like that's something I'm doing currently since, you know, it's new year, just wrapped up, opened three concepts last year, you know, got to get the ball rolling again this year. So that's kind of where I am personally, you know, in 2020 is starting new reach outs. And then I'm in course, I'm in, I'm in touch with the other groups, but you know, it, it's, it's always seems for me that it's either I have 30 things going on or like zip. So yeah. when I'm shipping, I like, that's when I get back to like grassroots and doing whatever I've got to do and, you know, reaching out to everyone, especially beginning of the year. I like to wait till like February. So you're not bugging people, but you know, it's a, you know, it's a full-time job trying to keep yourself busy. Oh, so. totally. Yeah. No, it's like as an independent consultant, your job is to get a job. Like it's like, it's mm -hmm. not unlike politicians. Like it's like their job is to get reelected. As soon as you get elected, you have to find out what's next. And if you do a really good yeah. job at, um, at consulting, then you kind of work yourself out of a job. Correct. Correct. I mean, do you like, what's your primary tool for that? Like, do you use email mostly or do you use phone, like pick up the phone and phone, make phone calls? Um, the way I do it is I, you know, go online and identify companies and such. And then I, then I find out who the partners in are, then I'll email them. So that's kind of what I'll do. I'll just create a list and then, um, you know, find out who the key players are and then go from there and do the reach outs. So it's kind of like a three-step process. You know, we talked about um, a little bit about the kind of mental burden on a on an independent consultant. Like, do you have like some sort of a morning routine, or is there is there something that you do every day to kind of keep the keep the regulate the the mental and physical strain of the job? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I definitely, I, I'm very structured and I'm very organized. So I have old school paper lists. I have electronic lists, you know, so I use all those tools, whether it's, you know, old school or modern. So I have those things and, um, you know, I get up, I have my little bit of cold brew, my little kombucha, take my, you know, anti-stress, um, homeopathic meds, acupuncture, you know, I have those things in the background, but, um, yeah, the key is to really be organized and have a day, you know, have a daily action plan, have a weekly action plan. You know, you, again, if you're on your own, you know, it's one thing if you've got other people driving this, but you have to drive it. So like, I'm very diligent in having the daily list, the weekly list, um, as I said, in both paper and electronic format. And each day it's like, okay, boom, this is what I'm doing today. And I think when you look at things like marketing or reach outs, like I'm talking about doing with these new agencies, I have to be in the right mood mood for that and like make sure my energy's up, especially if I'm going to be physically speaking. But certain days I do certain things. So certain like Monday is maybe not a day that I'm in the mood to do that because you're putting yourself out there. Um, So maybe Wednesday is more when I, you know, so I put things in certain days based on how I am you know, mentally, emotionally, like where I'm, where my head is at. Yeah. Yeah. No, I do the same thing. That's why like, um, when I book podcasts, for instance, like I have, I send out a link and saying, yeah, book the time that's most convenient for you in the, with the link. And you'll notice that Mondays are not available. Um, that's what, that, yeah. that's when I like reserve my day for all the inflow from clients. Um, and you know, to put out any fires that may exist, but also I just don't like to do shit on Mondays. Um, I also try not to do as much as possible on Fridays because I like long weekends yeah. and that's the kind of like, yeah. th- that's the other end of the, of the double edged sword of being a consultant is that you have a lot of freedom to create your own schedule. Um, I'm like you, right. I, I very much like a, a good amount of structure. Um, and so I keep just yeah. massive, massive checklists, um, th- mm-hmm. checklists that mm-hmm. I will never, ever get through. Um, and then just try yeah. to kind of work, work on things as I find them convenient and I, I find myself mentally available to work on. Right. Or as they're prioritized, like, you know, I've got a big event in August, so I have things lined up for it and I'm getting all the paperwork and things in order, but it's like, it's not until August, but I'm already, I've already got 50% of what I need to do done now and I'll have it all done next month. So I think that's important too, is when that is in terms of if it's a physical event or something, but you know, the, the actual timing of when you need to have everything in place, but always in advance. Okay. That's crazy. Okay. So you're talking about events in August. Um, we're recording this on February 11th, by the way. Um, so Dave is, uh, organizing things for August right now. Uh, I'm trying to master today, like later today, like as soon as, <laughs> like as soon as we hang up. <laughs> Stop. No, but you know what I mean? You kind of like, you have to like, you know, for me, just because of my OCD and ADD and all that stuff, like I just... I'm just always anxious about stuff. So I just, if I can get everything done like way in advance, like I love to do that when I have that opportunity. Yeah. Uh, do you also give yourself time to like not do that? Do, I mean, do you, uh, I mean, there's, there's, oh, there's OCD and then there's intensity. I, yeah. I feel like, I mean, I don't know, maybe, it, maybe it actually is OCD, but, um, but like, I feel like it's probably intensity and you put a lot of intensity yeah. into your work. And I think that that's very important. And I think that that's totally different. I'm, I'm, I'm very similar yeah. Um, you know, like obviously I I use systems like Trello and like Slack to communicate with my teams and to, and to make sure that things are done in priority order. Um, but once I'm done, I'm done. And like, once I put it down for the day, it's down for the day. Most of the time. I mean, at least I think, I mean, I I can't, I can't turn off my brain obviously, but like I'll, I'll close my computer and be like, I'm done for the day. Oh, definitely. I'm definitely. And that's the best part of, you know, running your own companies and businesses, which I've done for 25 years now. Like that's why I can never really go back. I I like having the flexibility. So when it isn't crazy, you know, I like when it's not crazy, but when it's crazy, I'm, I'm down. Like I can go, you know, I can go, you know, whatever, 14 days in a row, whatever the situation requires, but I'm trying to learn to be better. So when I do have downtime to really kind of embrace that. So 25 years is a really long time. Have you ever thought about hanging up your knives and getting some cushy corporate gig and just retiring? No, no, I can't retire. I got, I got too much more money to make. So, um, yeah, no corporate gig. I mean, unless it was like, oh yeah, you know, we're going to pay you a couple million a year, but otherwise I just can't. Um, I mean, I'd rather work at Trader Joe's like I can't. Yeah. Yeah. Not ready. Definitely not ready. I have a lot more to do and, you know, I'm still trying to figure that, figure out what that is, but I know, you know, 
again, I, I like the diversity of the consulting and the events because it's kind of like right brain, left brain. Mm -hmm. And I get satisfaction from both in different ways. You know, the consulting clients are normally, you know, at least events, you know, I can do the event, do the dinner, do the, you know, whatever it is, corporate cooking class. And then like, I get all the accolades of everyone loving it. Like that's, that's a more an immediate reward. The consulting is maybe more on the financial at the end of the, by the end of the project, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. You know, do you agree? Well, I mean, it's, it depends. I mean, some of them are better than others. Like corporate clients are always good typically and, yeah. and lucrative, but then yeah. you get these kind of nickel and dime things that kind of, that you're really into that, that, you know, you don't, they don't necessarily, it's like off Broadway or off, off Broadway gigs that you're just like, I'm, right. it's not right. as much money, right. but it's, but I'm really into it. And then there's like, yeah. what I really like is the event jobs. Cause it reminds me yeah. of when I was a shift bartender and it was just like, Okay, you work, you go and you work your job, and then you take your money, clean your bar, and then you walk away, and then you forget about it forever. <laughs> yes, 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 that's what I talk about. That's that's a great way to put it, and that's what I enjoy about that is that you know you have the lead up and the build up, and then you're done, and it's awesome. I love that closure. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, I mean, so it doesn't always work out like that. Obviously, sometimes it's uh, sometimes things linger. Um, sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's a bad thing. But uh, I mean, the things that you've been working on as far as like these big, um, these big dining parks. Uh, I remember you turned me on this this thing last year. And yeah. it was a big, it was a big, big project. I mean, we're talking about, you know, 10,000 covers a day, something like that. It was a big fast casual operation with multiple outlets in, in the same park. And, and it was kind of built into some sort of residential thing, if I remember right. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, and that is kind of what we're going to start seeing a lot more of, it seems like, because that's not the first yeah. thing. That's not the only thing like in that similar vein that's come across my desk. And like, I have a couple of pitches in for something like that right now. And um, it seems to be like, that is a much more, that's a much safer bet for, for developers, for, um, yes. for landowners, um, yes. And, uh, and for consumers as well. I mean, it seems to be like consolidating fast casual rather than doing these mega dining outlets is kind of yes. what we're going to see in the future. And, and in your opinion, what is the, what is the future of dining in the gig and, 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 uh, convenience economies? Yeah. 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 Definitely those, you know, cause retail is out, right. You know, retail is dying. You know, I've got a couple buddies that are specifically in commercial real estate and that's what they do is they buy and sell those large scale properties. And, um, you know, that's the dinosaur, you know, not just because of Amazon, but other people do things online and there's just the convenience that's available. So the entertainment and food based concepts, which is what we're talking about, you know, those are extremely popular because, you know, great for young families, great for, you know, millennials, you know, do enjoy, um, you know, they don't want to tip, you know, they love to be able to, and I'm not putting them all, but that is the category that everyone's appealing to because mm -hmm. they've got the most uh, spendable dough right now. So that's why I'm addressing that. Um, yeah. You know, hey. pool of people. I mean, it's all good. Like millennial, that's great. You know, embrace it, be a millennial. I don't care. Um, but, you know, they enjoy that. Fast casual, I love it. That's why fast casual is definitely one of the trends. And then when you tie that into the entertainment based market or related, you know, that's what's happening. Well, there's a couple of reasons too, especially with the fast casual and the multiple uh, food uh, outlets in that one space. You know, there's smaller spaces typically. You don't have the overhead with labor. There's so many different factors that come into play. And obviously, money is a, the, one of the biggest ones. And one of the biggest reasons places fail or close is because, you know, rent and space and staffing. And, you know, there's so many things that make it collapse aside from poor management. Um, yeah. Poor management, but, poor management and undercapitalization, I would say are probably the top two reasons. Bars are correct. Correct. Exactly. And then a whole subset of like a hundred other things, but um, the, uh, you know, definitely that's happening, you know, fast casual, uh, you know, and there's a couple categories of fast casual that I, you know, there's like the super fast casual that has no booze and stuff like that. Then you have, you know, kind of the upscale fast casual where, you know, they may bring it to your table. There's like a bar component that's tied into that. Right. Jason, I'm sure you're seeing there's, and there's, there's kind of the couple like Q yeah. like QSRs and fast casuals are kind of starting to merge a little bit. Like you see this where like Starbucks yeah. is starting to serve liquor now and, um, and Chipotle is starting to serve beer and like, yeah, they're, they're kind of starting to merge. Yeah, a bit. And, you know, so you're seeing the, the convergence of the two and then that way it can appeal to those other consumers because I may, 
although I like I I you know work on a lot of fast casual and related concepts. Like that's not where I die. Like right. I like a server. Like I don't want to like carry a number. Like that's just not my thing. Because one, I do it for a living. So like I do enough of that at home and for my friends and family that when I go out, I want to have a server. Like I want to be served. I'm not carrying my fucking tray. You know. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm definitely. I mean, I'm a different demographic, but part of it is because of my career. So I want a real experience, not fancy. Just. I want it to be good, but I want someone to take my order. Oh, and that and that expectation is right out there in front, and you're willing to pay for it. You're willing to pay gratuity and blah 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 blah. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. In the context of where you see QSR and fast casual going, yeah, exactly. um, um, and I was going to ask you about your strange ability to adapt to any global cuisine ever. Like, what do you think about in home experiences? Yeah. So there's so there's two things. So on that, in I want to throw one other thing on the QSR fast casual. I think what you're seeing now, and this is a trend based, right? If you're noticing, which I know you are, but you know, whoever, if you're there listening, look out there. There's so many other things that are coming. It's not just burgers and pizza. Like, you know, that's blown and it's still growing. I don't know how, but, um, you know, you've got burgers and pizzas are safe. Oh, totally, totally. You know, but you've got Indian, you've got all these other, you know, because we've run out of stuff, right? We've run out of the the norm. So there are definitely a lot more global flavors coming into play. And that, so that's one of the things you'll see in those concepts, like Mediterranean, Greek, like those are really taking off. Um, There's a couple brands that are just like growing by gangbusters in that category. So definitely, and I think part of, you know, all these food shows and all this shit that's out there, like everyone's seems to be a little more educated or into food. So that's why it's allowing those opportunities for different types of cuisine to enter into the market and explore the profitability. So I think that's something we're seeing um, or and going to continue to see more of. And that ties into the second part of what you were talking to me about, which is, I mean, look what I did last year. I did an Indian fast casual um, that was in Manhattan. And then I did a Georgian and not, you know, it's not, chicken and waffles from Atlanta. That's like Russian Georgian. And then most recently an Indonesian Malaysian concept. So, you know, like, and they're all, the Georgian restaurant is more of a restaurant, but the other two are kind of in, they're totally on the fast casual side. So, you know, there are definitely opportunities there. Now here's the deal. One, there's an opportunity, but we have to, you know, do these work. And that's really the next thing that we need to kind of see. I know the Greek and Mediterranean really seems to be working, but I don't know how Indian and some of these others, and like I've seen a lot of, uh, there's another brand that has like 12 locations now. It's like a kebab style joint, which I guess still ties into that uh, Mediterranean and Middle Eastern. But um, I think those are doing well. I just don't know the Indian and things like that. Like, are people ready for that? I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, it seems like even people are starting to take even a little bit more risk in niching down in, you know, national brands like, you know, North Indian versus South Indian, mm-hmm. you know, chicken, chicken, waffle yeah, chick, yeah. It, like was just like, just got a huge uh, VC, got some huge VC dollars pumped into her. Um, you know, like there's yeah. like, there's into that business. I mean, like that's, you know, as long as it's not a single restaurant where where a single person is the proprietor, it seems like there's still money going out to, to concepts that are as long as they're you know the, the numbers work. Uh, yes, yes, there are definitely that, and then there's a lot of just like independents that have some dough and want to try it, and so you know the, it's I mean at the end of the day it's a litmus test. I you know you don't really know, and it'll be interesting to see how you know, these concepts, they're all still open right now. Well, one just opened this week, so I'm hopeful they're still open, but, um, you know, the, uh, (laughs) it's just, you know, there's just so many factors that it takes to be successful in the food game. And especially when you're, you know, exploring a new concept or not the traditional, you know, AKA burgers and pizzas, but that's in answering the other question. I'm super stoked that I've been able to land these. Well, for example, the Indian client was Indian, the Georgian client was Georgian. So the fact that I was able to get in and have them meet me and have me have them trust me with, you know, preparing, you know, the food of their childhood or their uh, culture or background, you know, has been really awesome because I take it. I love that. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, I'm French trained and all that and I'm very well traveled. So that obviously helps. And I, I, I like to try different types of cuisine, but I really love that opportunity and challenge 
to create food from whatever region. And I kind of really do a deep dive into it. And um, I really try to keep it uh, true to the origin in terms of ingredients and, you know, really make it real. Yeah. I mean, how much of it do you think is like your ability to reproduce traditional dishes from a country that you've never, that you've never lived in yeah. versus how much you're able to be a wise business decision because you have experience and you're reliable and you know what you're doing on the business sense. Like you can cost out a dish and say, this is how this fits into your overall business plan. Right, right. So keeping those two in sync, the 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 true dish and the pricing, is that the question? Yeah. 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 I mean, like it's like yeah. like when you, like if you have an Indian client who's coming to you, um, this this guy from Southern California um, right. <laughs> and saying, can you reproduce an Indian dish when there are other consulting oh, yeah, chefs from India out there? I'm, I'm presuming, yeah. um, it's a country yeah, of a billion totally. people. Yeah. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm totally. guessing they have their own chefs there too. Why would they pick you yeah. over somebody like that? Yeah, same. And, you know, and that was the case in all of these three most recent concepts. It's all, you know, they're from that region and, and that was the big thing. And, you know, again, these agencies are the consultants that referred me. I was just able to be like, Hey guys, you know, like luckily I've had some experience, but I guess they, I guess they trust me. And once they've met me like before and they're like, well, the guy's not Indian, you know, or the guy's not Georgian. And it's like, well, just meet him. And so kind of, I guess I'm good in person. Um, yeah. And then they end up trusting me. And then, you know, because I listen to them and I'm, cause typically with these, these aren't like big conglomerates. These are like small, you know, one or two investor type size projects. So, you know, I listen to them and it's like, well, you know, you guys, you have this concept idea. I'm sure there are dishes that you want to have. And I have them talk about that, but I always kind of go in knowing some of the signature dishes from the region. So I can just like immediately start talking about it. And then from there go and, and reproduce it. Uh, like with the Georgian concept, they actually, I went to Georgia for three or four days, um, which was, uh, yeah, it's great if you love chain smoking, but um, <laughs> I mean, I'm just, was, I'm just picturing it, a lot of briny food and vodka. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know anything about Georgian food. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very interesting. It's very heavy, you know, cause again, it's regionally based the temperature and the weather, but, um, a lot of cigarettes, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it was cool. That was a great immersion, which, um, you get to really, we saw all the different facets, you know, we saw the mom and play, pop places. We went to a higher end place in a museum. They did a day where all their friends and family brought dishes over. So that was a really, great immersion for me to really kind of see and taste and, you know, understand where they were coming from in terms of uh, the food side of things. So that was really great. And then when I do the other concepts like Indian and such, again, they have a little inspiration and then I'll have them go, I'll go to their favorite places with them to kind of understand where the direction is. So that's kind of how that I'm just kind of sharing how the process works typically. And even when, um, you know, or if it's a Mexican concept, like, I mean, I can do that with my eyes closed, but, um, yeah. you know, things like that are super easy, but, you know, e anytime I go to do one, like I was working on another one and some of these never go to the end they get halfway through and they're like, Oh, we're not going to do this. I'm like, okay, great. But, um, even if I was doing like an American, like comfort food one, even in that, even though that is totally like, boom, like no brainer for me, we still spend the time to take the client and go check out of a, a lot of other concepts and kind of see what they like and make sure that in terms of not just the branding, but in terms of the food and how we're going to put it all together. That's kind of what uh, we do as a team to ensure that we're kind of staying on track. And then I guess I'm just sharing more about kind of how the process works for people that don't know, you know, we start at point a, and then we go through this whole process, the immersion, we do the tastings and then do the menu selections and then, you know, get further into that costing and, you know, doing suppliers and training. But um, <clears throat> that's kind of part of the process in any concept, which is, I, I enjoy that. Pro the immersion is kind of my favorite part because yeah. it keeps me on top of things to see what's happening out there. But um, and and, yeah. I mean, and the the life cycle of like onboarding a client. I mean, even despite all that vetting that you do, where you say, "Hey, this is what what I'm thinking. Um, this is uh, these are the dishes that I want to prepare for you." You actually prepare the dishes for them. They taste them and say, "Okay, this is great." Um, and then then you move on. And then occasionally, sometimes the whole process stalls. Right. I mean, so you have uh -huh. to, so, I, I, so yeah. I mean, like you still have to maintain a reasonable level of dispassion about the whole thing because you don't know if it could move forward or not, right? Until the check clears. Yes. 
Exactly. Yes, exactly. And that's really important too. If this, you know, if that's our audience we're talking to, it's, you know, it's all about contracts. Like when I first moved to New York, I got burned several times to the tune of thousands of dollars. And so that was when it really got me to tighten up contracts, proposals, all of those things, you know, getting money up front, other milestones where you collect additional funds, you know, separate contracts for, you know, other components. Like now my training is a separate component in case, Again, as I talked about, like there were three or four concepts I did within the last two years, including that one I tried to bring you in on Jason. But <laughs> Star one. They, they totally dropped. They totally dropped the whole ball. You know, <laughs> they you know they canceled the design agency and all the architecture stuff, and they were already in a couple hundred grand there. And then I had done like a tasting, and we kind of had the menu lined out. I mean, I got that first part, but then they just were like, you know, keep it, which is how it is in my contract. But like once the money's in my pocket, you're not getting money back because you may, they may not take it to fruition. And that's, I have literally four projects like that, that we did tastings, you know, they were already like, you know, in the architectural phase, brand and design. And then who knows why they just decide not to do it. So that's something that everyone needs to be very leery about no matter how well funded or how amazing and perfect everything seems you may not make it to the finish line. So that's something that the last four or five years, as I've delved more into these types of projects, I've learned that, you know, great, you can put that whatever X dollars on your AR, but you may, you're only going to see, you may only see part of that. Yeah. It's not pushed like saying, Hey, this is my number. Um, and saying this is, I need a deposit on this before I start working is not pushy. It's professional. It's what everybody, it's what all the other trades do. Like you say, this is what I cost. This is my number. If you want to negotiate, yeah. maybe we can negotiate. Okay, fine. Um, right. But um, but once you sign this contract, then it comes with another piece of paper. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's not, a lot of times people have a hard time asking for that because they think that they're being pushy or they think that they're being, you know, unprofessional, but you know, it is the professional move to say like it, once you have, have an agreement, you, you put it down on a piece of paper. I'd like to do it in the form of either a short proposal, which looks a lot like an invoice. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. and, uh, and then I send it. And then once I get the deposit, then we start getting to work, but you know, yeah. you know, yeah. thank yous do not pay the bills. Um, my landlord yeah. does not take gratitude. Um, and yeah. so it's like, you know, you need to get a deposit for this stuff and it's totally okay. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely proposal, contract scope of work everything clearly spelled out and then what those milestones are in terms of payment which i think i used to have like 50 50 now it's like 50 25 25 like i you know i'm not messing around because i want to, whatever work i've done to that point i want to be compensated for and not you know have it flop or something like that and the monies that i lost years ago weren't they just weren't like this there were just you know maybe some more mickey mouse people that you know you trust them you know, New York, um, New York, New York, yeah, Yeah, it is the worst. So, you know, I learned early on in the first couple of years. And then from there, that's just something that's very important is to have a solid proposal that outlines what you're doing and what your role is along with your comp plan and how you're being paid and, you know, where, when and where that's taking place. Yeah, a lot a lot of this falls in line with phase planning. So if you're like, okay, and I and I like to get paid for the also the pitching process. Um, so if I spend a lot of money and time into like investing into a like multi page proposal that, that articulates exactly what I'm going to be doing, then I typically uh-huh. bill for that in the form of like onboarding or like I bill for that time. Um, right. You know, and if and it's a risk right. because sometimes you don't get sometimes you don't get um, the job, and so like it's you know right. it, it could work out one way or the other. But it's like I use Wave. Um, a lot of people use QuickBooks or a lot of people use FreshBooks, um, especially as like yeah. a solo independent business. What do you use? QuickBooks. I'm QuickBooks. QuickBooks. Uh, does that tie into all your tax stuff and do you do your own taxes or yeah. do you- everything's integrated? Yeah, everything's integrated. I do most of my payments are all electronic at this point. So I don't really, I mean, checks, you know, I don't really get those and I prefer the money just rolling into the bank. Oh, totally. Yeah. No, I don't want it to, if I don't have to touch cash, I don't touch it at all. I'm the same way. Yeah. Um, uh, with credit card fees, I, I charge three and a half percent for credit cards. If you want to use a credit card, but I still, oh, yeah, I still take it. Guess what? You're paying the fee. One, yeah. yeah some, somebody's paying the fee. Um, has anybody recently ever tried to like lowball you? 
<laughs> as far as like your fees or anything. Oh my gosh, everyone wants to lowball. It, it sucks because somebody, somebody's like, because like especially when it's slow, you're like, oh well, you know, yes, maybe maybe, yes, maybe yes, I'll do it this yes. one time yes. because I because you know I need the cash flow right now and blah blah blah. But then like. It ends up biting you in the ass because those clients tend to be the fussiest. (laughs) They're the nightmare. Yeah. I mean, I officially just had the worst client I've ever had in 25 years of business, but that's a separate story. But, um, you know, you've got to, they're the worst, the worst, but um, you've got to make sure that you're going to be happy with it in terms of the money. So of course, negotiation and go in, it's the standard for any business kind of go in, well, go in with your ideal. But knowing that there is room to take that back a bit, but I mean, let's say I'm just going to use num- round numbers. Like let's say whatever it's a small project you want, twenty five k, and you know, so you ask maybe for twenty eight, and then they come in at twenty two. You know, it's like, can you get them closer to the twenty five, which is what you really wanted? So there is kind of typically that kind of play. But yeah. I try to just be. I try. To, here's here's something again. This is from me being a recruiter. One of the things. It's the same as like, you know, when you're negotiating a salary, right? You want to ask what their budget is. So that's something that I always ask, whether it's a consulting client or an event client or a recipe client, what's your budget? Yeah. Because here's the deal. Everyone always has a budget. Okay. So when, and it pisses me off because I'll ask, and this is like on the event side, it's like, oh, well, you know, we wanted to spend, you know, 200 a person or whatever. It's like, or what they're like, well, we really didn't have a budget. And it's like, okay, well, dinner for 10 is 10 grand. Oh, oh, well, we want to spend that much. It's like, well, bitch, what's your budget? And you, you, know, have, everyone you, budget. You, you definitely know what you don't want. Okay, that's a that's Exactly, a, that's a exactly. So, so if someone's like, well, we don't really have a budget, then just throw out an astronomical figure and they'll be like, oh, we don't want to pay that much. It's like, well, then what is your target? Like, give me that because when I do a proposal and I, I put the price out, I want to know what's going to come in. So like typically if I'm with these agencies, they'll be like, what are you guys thinking? You, I know what you already know what, you know, they're already being paid. Right. So they already know what the client's going to want to roll out. It's like, well, oh, they're trying to target this. Great. Then I'm going to come in in that range. Cause I don't like to dick around. I, I just want to come in and get the deal, but I want it to be at the rate that I need to make it worth my while. Definitely an important investment in your brand as well. Saying no sometimes. Yes. <laughs> well, that's why I moved from New York to San Diego. So now I can say no. Cause actually on this last project, we didn't have the training components signed or deposits or whatever. And they were hemming and hawing. And I was just like, you know what? Suck it. I'm like, just, I- I'm done. You guys figure it out. I don't want to deal with you anymore. And you know, if I were still in New York, that little bit of change left on the table, I would not have been able to not do. So that was my first, you know, I've just been back in California for like six or seven, six months. So it is nice to be able to say no. And if your gut is telling you that there it's a red flag, then you need to trust your gut because it's a red flag. If it's a red flag in the beginning, get ready to get to the end when all the money is being spent and stuff, it becomes, yeah, a bigger red flag, like a nightmare. Oh, yeah, uh, I'm sure we could just go on that oh, for okay. a long time. We even We're keeping this positive in light and giving you know the tips. One thousand percent, one thousand percent. Okay, <laughs> well, thank you so much, Chef Dave Martin. Um, it has been such a pleasure catching up with you and talking about your your war stories. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> uh, is there anything? Uh, how would we find you on, on social media? I'm Chef Dave Martin on all platforms. Nice, an early adopter. Yes, yes, <laughs> exactly, exactly. For sure. All right. Well. Well, thanks so much. Well, that wraps up my interview with Chef Dave Martin. What I really appreciate about the chef is his candid, open nature about talking about the back end of the business that nobody ever really sees. So thank you, Chef, for being so open and honest about the realities of being an independent consultant in the F&B world. It's not always fun. It's not always pretty. It doesn't always pay. Uh, and you know, sometimes, it's, uh, sometimes it doesn't always work out, even if you are on the level that Chef Dave is. To find Dave Martin, check out his website, chefdavemartin.com, or on all social media platforms, at Chef Dave Martin. I hope you enjoyed this episode about being an independent consulting chef. Be sure to check out the show notes for a brief summary of the show and, and links to anything that we talked about. I like to keep the shows as short and dense as possible, but you know what? I felt everything in this episode was important, so I pretty much kept it all. If you have any thoughts, questions, or ideas, please be sure to reach out to me at Jason Luttrell on Twitter and Instagram, or search for Jason Luttrell on Facebook or LinkedIn. I'm quite active on all of them, including TikTok. It's hilarious. Uh, if you got anything out of our time together, you can thank me by simply sharing this with another person. Just text, email, or 
share it on your social media, whatever. If you love the show, please hit the subscribe button or leave a comment on Stitcher, iTunes, Google, Spotify, wherever it is that you get your podcasts. The ratings and reviews are oddly a big deal. And uh, that helps me get in front of new people. So thank you so much. Um, I hope to see you next time on The Latrell Show.